Um, most of you are probably already on it, but I do run a, uh, an email newsletter uh, every month about the coming events. So uh, if you're not on it and you'd like to be, please come up afterwards and put your name on this chip, this clipboard, and um, we'll put it on the system. It's my great pleasure this evening to welcome Dr. Sarah Bakewell, uh, who is an, an author of many books, um, including How to Live and the Existentialist, Existentialist Cafe. Um, and these books are here this evening together with her current book, book uh, Humanly Possible. And she's received the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize in nonfiction in, 19, in, in 2018, and also the Rosalind Franklin Medal in 2023. So we think of humanism as a philosophy, but it has come to prominence in the last half century, but it has a long history before that, meaning, I think, more than one thing. So I look forward to hearing about it. Sarah. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction and thank you very much everybody for, for coming along this evening. Um, the first question that uh, usually, well, I ask myself and everybody asks me and I think um, it's uh, quite a common question that comes up is, what is humanism? Um, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, and a lot of humanism is about being influenced by other people's books. So I thought I'd start by stealing from somebody else's book entirely. Um, but I'm stealing a scene, uh, and it's from a book, a novel by David Nobbs. Um, some of you might remember The Rise and the Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin. Uh, he was the author of that. Um, but he was also an author of a novel called Second from Last in the Sack Race. And in that, um, it's set, there's a scene in a school where the students decide to set up a humanist society. So they all meet up. And the first question that they have to wonder about is, what is humanism? So one of them says, well, isn't it the when the Renaissance was trying to escape from medieval ideas and starting a new way of thinking and... And then somebody else says, no, I, I thought it's about being kind and, and nice to animals and things and having charities and visiting old people and things. Um, and somebody else says, but that you're confusing humanism with humanitarianism. Um, somebody else says, oh, we're just wasting time. To which the uh, first, the humanitarian one says, do you call bandaging sick animals and being nice to people a waste of time? Um, and somebody else says, no, it's a philosophy. Anyway, it's all nonsense because it's a philosophy that it rejects supernaturalism and regards human beings as natural um, and asserts the, the basic dignity and worth of humanity um, without God. But then somebody else says, no, but there the can be religious humanists. And, and this whole first meeting of the humanist society just falls apart in, in total disarray. Um, so that's the difficulty of defining it. Um, when I read that, which was when I, you know, sort of was wrestling with that problem myself, and um, I thought, well, maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing that it has so many definitions, so many angles, so many ways to be a humanist, that it can mean all these things, because it's really an incredibly rich tradition or a rich kind of bundle of traditions, which are all related, even though they're incredibly varied, all the way from the non-religious idea of, of kind of modern campaigning humanism to humanists as those who study the humanities, to the Renaissance meaning, to the idea of living well. As... And what they all have, they do have something in common, which is right there in the word humanism. It's human, it's that they all, in different ways, they all put the human, cultural and moral, social, artistic world, the world, in, the, in other words, which we live in a lot of the time, the world of language and communication and sort of history and thinking and talking, it puts that human cultural world in some way 
in the center. So the distinction really is on the one hand with the divine realm, which is studied by theology, um, and the, the purely physical realm, which is studied by the sciences. And instead we have this human realm and it's like, let's take that seriously in one way or the other. And that's what all I think these, these strands of humanism have in common. But it is very rich and varied and it's like, that's not maybe a bad thing. So that was my starting point when I was sort of plunging into the book. Um, and I wanted to really tell the story of humanists rather than of humanism as any kind of single ideology. So, and that's what I'm gonna do in this talk as well, is just take one or two humanists well, more than one or two, uh, yeah, half a dozen or more humanists from different parts of humanism, different parts of history. They all straddle a, a I did limit it slightly to kind of 1300 to today. Um, it's not much of a limitation, I, I know, but it's a, and mostly Western European or American, which is not to say that humanism itself is limited in that way. It's just, that's the story that I ended up telling. So to start with, you know, this idea of humanist as somebody who studies the humanities, the big, the reason I started in 1300 is that that's when um, somebody who often people who write about humanism start with him, Francesco Petrarca or Petrarch, um, as we call him in English. Um, he was a poet, there's a big clue in the fact that he's got those massive great laurels on his head. This of course is not a contemporary picture of him at all. It's much, much later, but um, he did, he was crowned with the poetic laurels because he was a great poet. He, the Petrarch and sonnets are still one of the best known genres, but he started being trained for the law. This was kind of what his, his father wanted him to do but he really hated it. And there came this moment in his youth where he decided to abandon legal studies and devote himself to literature, both to writing it, editing it, reading, interpreting, and collecting books, collecting manuscripts, um, which was you know, not that easy to do because they were, first of all, there was no printing, of course, um, and a lot of the manuscripts were, sort of in various places, but a lot of them were in monasteries where it was quite hard to know what was in them if you weren't part of the community. So he went around um, collecting these along with his great friend, Giovanni Boccaccio. Um, that name is probably best known today for, he wrote a book called The Decameron. The Decameron is a collection of a hundred little stories um, and they're not all bawdy, but some of them are bawdy. Um, he kind of was showing the range of what he could do in writing. Um, the bawdy ones are, are the most fun, as you can imagine. And um, sort of the, to give a flavor, one of the ones that uh, that I actually made me sort of laugh out loud when reading it was, um, there's a convent and the, the mother superior asleep at night, somebody comes to tell her that one of the nuns is in bed with a young man. So she gets up and goes bustling off to find this nun to tell her off. But everybody laughs at her because she didn't realize that in her haste, instead of putting her, her cap on, they always wore these sort of headdresses, she put on the breeches of the priest that she herself was in bed with at the time. And there's even a little illustration of this in one of the editions, one of the early editions of the Decameron. But he wrote a lot more than that. I mean, this was, he was really showing what he could do, you know, this great range of stories. It was a very, very much what they both liked to do was to kind of show off a bit, basically. But why are they considered the first modern European humanists? Um, it's really largely about how they defined what they thought they were doing. Um, Petrarch in particular had this sort of great sense of a mission. He had a great sense of, of what he could do through these humanist humanistic studies. Um, he kind of invented the concept of the dark ages actually, because what he thought that he was doing was 
going back to the classical world, to the great classical literature, especially of Roman writers, he couldn't actually read ancient Greek. I mean, very few people could at that time, um, although he tried to um, learn a little bit, um, but mainly Latin authors. And he thought by going back and, and finding more of these texts and studying them and imitating them and writing, just like Cicero, who was one of his great, the great ones that he admired, that um, this very dark time that he felt that they were living in could be revived, there could be like, drawing on the past, you could have a new beginning and bring light, a kind of new light back into the world. Um, there's this lovely bit that he wrote, he's actually here addressing one of his own poems, as you do, um, a poem called Africa. And he says, um, my fate to mine Petrarch is to live amid varied and confusing storms. But for you, the poem, perhaps if, as I hope you'll live long after me, there will follow a better age. The sleep of forgetfulness will not last forever. When the darkness has been dispersed, our descendants can come again in the form of pure radiance. So there's this great sense of, of, of light. It's like there was a light in the classical world. It was lost, and but it can be, you know, the flame can be lit again. Um, and, you know, it's and that idea had was very influential in how we think about the Renaissance for for a long time. Of course, now it's you know it's we think a bit more critically about this idea of the Dark Ages, but that really was Petrarch's way of thinking about it. And um, it's understandable that that he and Boccaccio and their other friends felt that way, really, because the 14th century was an absolutely terrible time to be living in Western Europe. Um, there were a lot of wars, skirmishes, sieges. Um, the Italian peninsula was all battles between various city-states and princes and influences. Um, there was just general insecurity. If you traveled anywhere, you could be attacked by brigands. Um, and there was the plague. So very famously, there was the Black Death, which arrived in Western Europe um, in the mid in 1348 it was actually like 1347 really and um petrarch and boccaccio were both lucky enough not to get it but they lost many of their friends so they had this tremendous sense of loss and the context for the decameron in fact is that there's a group of friends who flee florence in order to hole up in the countryside to avoid the plague because florence is falling apart florence all the civic life of florence you know so many people are dying that it's falling to bits. So there was this sense, you know, it's not surprising they thought in terms of loss and recovery and what you could preserve and how you could find a kind of wisdom in the past and, and use it for a new beginning. Um, but there's also the sense that they found consolation in um, the past. So consolation in all this literature and all the, what the great minds of of the classical world had come up with and beautiful language, um, beautiful Latin. Um, there's a kind of connection, a sense of connection with the past and a sense that by drawing on it, you can fortify yourself against all this pain and trouble. Um, and an almost literal, it's not literal, but a, an example of fortification from a couple of generations later is um, from one of those very, very rare people, a female humanist, Christine de Pizan. And there she, there she is with her books, sort of apparently being listened to by a group of four scholars, which is, you know, it, it's sort of quite impressive that she managed to get them to listen to her. She was very, she was quite respected. She um, was the first that we know of female professional writer because she, um, after her husband and father died, she supported both her own children and her mother purely by writing, writing things for the, um, the court of the French king in particular. And with tremendous versatility. So she wrote about ethics and politics and questions of war. I mean, rather masculine subjects. She wrote love poetry. And in 1405, she wrote a book called The Book of the City of Ladies. And the idea of that is, that's the city of ladies. So the narrator is very, 
depressed by reading all the awful things in literature that men have, or listening in person to the, all of the awful things that men have said about women and how, you know, they're lustful and irrational and, you know, unreliable and all these um, depressing uh, things. And she's cheered by a figure called Reason um, appears with a couple of sidekicks and says, and, and presents some arguments, you know, for not being demoralized by this. She says, you know, have all these male writers, have they never been wrong about anything? Clearly they they have because they've often disagreed with each other or they've, you know, corrected each other. So they can't all be right. So, you know, they so it's like a rational argument for not being too depressed because they clearly can't all be right. And so she recommends that to the narrator that she build in her mind a city and the bricks of that city are composed of all the examples that she can come up with from mythology, history, literature of great women, queens, goddesses, whatever it may be, who have you know been brave or wise or inspiring um, to fortify herself and to sort of give herself a sense of hope. So it's that literature is consolation, um, but it's not just for feeling better um, because all this literary study could also shake up um, a lot of the comfort, uh, shake up comforting certainties. And um, there's a sort of bit of a hero of mine, Lorenzo Valla, who uh, was writing in the 1400s we're in now. Um, he was a, literary scholar and a specialist in, in Latin. He was a, a linguist or philologist, um, expert in rhetoric as well. He wrote rhetoric manuals. He translated, he did speak Greek. He'd studied Greek and translated from it. And notably he used his, um, here he is again, later picture, no, but uh, not that much later actually, but he, um, used his skills in particular to, to take apart a text called The Donation of Constantine. The story of that was um, supposedly in the year 315. Um, the Emperor Constantine had um, been suffering from leprosy and he went to, he asked the Pope at the time, Sylvester I, to, to, to help him. And so the Pope you know, gave him his blessing and Fabulously, he was cured of his leprosy and he recovered. And supposedly in exchange, he promised the Pope and all his successors um, total dominion over the whole of Western Europe, including the Italian peninsula, which, you know, which was all in his empire. Um, so this was like, by thanks of this, forevermore the church had this claim over the whole of Western Europe. So they loved to, you know, tell themselves this story and it was... So it was recorded in a document which existed called the Donation of Constantine. Constantine. Uh, this is the scene that supposedly occurred with uh, the emperor and the, and the pope. This is a fresco uh, of 1247 um, in Rome, illustrating the scene. But in fact, it was all nonsense. And the document was a forgery, um, which was done not in the fifth century, the fourth century rather, but in the eighth century, in order to justify, you know, the, obviously the popes were very keen to justify their claims to territory. Um, and the German emperors were quite keen on also having this kind of blessing on their, being able to call themselves the Holy Roman Emperor. So Lorenzo Valla wrote a treatise showing that this text could not have been written in the fourth century um, and he did that, you know, by various historical arguments, um, but also just by analyzing the language. So he took all these examples and said, well, you know, there's a, like a word for sa satraps, cum omnibus satrapis nostris. Um, he said, well, Roman officials weren't called satraps in the fourth century. They weren't called that until the eighth century. And then there was another banner, which is a, a word for flag. He said that at that time would have been a different word for exilium. So he gave all these examples um, of, and, and so it's that study of language which was started with Petrarch and, and you know, was sort of almost for comfort. This is the beauty and the wisdom of classical literature. 
But valor really made it into a weapon as well. It's like if you study, if you really understand the, the historical context and the um, meaning of words and the way that words have changed, then you can detect these impostures. And he was not afraid at all to, to attack the, the papacy. Um, I mean, it partly helped he was doing it because um, it was very pleasing to his current patron, who was the King of Naples, who was contesting territory with the Pope. So he did it a bit to help his, his patron. But it also was just typical of him that he really wasn't um, afraid of anything, you know, and he wasn't afraid to, to use this critical thinking, critical skills and knowledge. Um, and he also used it against some of his fellow humanists. So these ones who thought, you know, everything that Cicero did was just wonderful and every word that he used was, was beautiful beyond all compare. And so you should all try and, we should all try and write like Cicero. You know, there were a few that said, if a word's not in Cicero, then I won't use it. <laughs> it's like, it's like C Cicero is a dictionary of the Latin language. You know, if it's not in Cicero, it's not Latin. Um, so much did they admire him. And he just thought that was ridiculous, you know. I mean, it wasn't that he said, don't follow models from the past at all, but he said, um, you know, you can follow more than one model. You know, it's not, there's not, don't revere these people too much. Um, another great critical scholar um, with similar, you know, even greater, if anything, range of knowledge also uh, mocked that those, and that's Erasmus. Um, again, we're getting into a bit of a later, this is late 15th, early 16th century. Um, I mean, he pointed out one of the absurdities, one of these great Cicero admirers was called um, Christophe Longueuil in French. He was French, but, or Christophe, Christophorus Longelius. And Erasmus said, well, as soon as he even mentions his own name, he's using a word that Cicero wouldn't have known because it's Christ carrier. And... <laughs> Cicero lived before Christ. So, you know, he's breaking his own rule as soon as he, he even uses his own name. But Erasmus also, there's that tradition again of using his um, expertise, his incredibly deep study of, of Latin and of historical usages um, to do better, better translations of religious texts and notably the New Testament doing a new translation of that, um, trying to sort of give a better foundation, you know, stripping away all the things, including things from church authorities, in fact, or things that were considered untouchable, um, stripping those away to go back to a cleaner, purer, more authentic text. Um, and, you know, he thought that by doing that, he would strengthen the whole Christian community. Um, but he was writing in the middle of what was actually the great split in, in Christendom between Protestant and Catholic. So it was a time of religious war um, and which saddened him enormously. Uh, he was very saddened by war in general, really. He liked to think that through this community of study, you know, this model of all these friends who were all devoted to knowledge and learning, the hope that that was sort of a model for how um, people might live in what he called friendship among many and of course you know it wasn't quite like that as I think we, we're all aware um it's it, this idea of a sort of network makes me think of E.M. Forster where this little jump to the 20th century there who had this phrase only connect um it appears in Howard's End and he makes it the epigraph of the book. What he meant by that, um, which I find inspiring, I, I sort of, it was my motto when I was writing the book really, was finding connections between um, people. So this is what Erasmus was, friendship among many. Um, Forster also, you know, said friendship was more important than anything. Um, but also sort of understanding other people as best we can and, um, finding connections between ideas and also between actions and their consequences. So thinking, if I do this, what effect is it going to have on somebody else? Um, and it requires, it brings a sort of need for critical thinking um, as well, not critical thinking about 
um, Latin usage necessarily, but critical thinking about um, claims that people make, well, does it really stand up um, for everybody the same way? Does it, am I thinking that way just because it serves me and not thinking of how it appears to somebody else? So only connect sort of means all of that. Um, a case of that is um, the justifications, and this is a bit of a, also another historical leap. We're slightly, we're going back into the 19th century. Justifications, you know, have often been given for why, um, through history, for why slavery is is sort of a natural, you know, a natural state of affairs and, and it's right. You know, there are all these people, uh, often from a theological perspective, not always writing to say, well, it's only, you know, it's only natural that, um, that there should be slaves, enslaved people. And Frederick Douglass, who had himself been born into slavery and had, after enormous difficulties had finally managed to escape, um, and became a noted abolitionist speaker, orator, autobiographer. Um, he said something that uh, is just so obvious, but somehow it, you know, it obviously wasn't obvious to everyone that um, there is not a man between the canopy of heaven, beneath the canopy of heaven, that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. <laughs> so nobody says, yes, slavery is natural and right, and therefore I... I should be a slave. I mean, everybody always, you know, knows that it's wrong for themselves. So it's just, you know, only connect again. Um, he wrote a, Frederick Douglass wrote an open letter, published an open letter to his ex-slave owner, um, the person who claimed to own him, Thomas Old, asking, you know, how would you feel if the tables were turned? How would you feel if it was you or your daughters? Um, he had some daughters you know, who were in this position, um, sort of encouraging him, trying to get him to think critically. He also, um, although he was he was no um, atheist, but he was very critical of the hypocrisy of the, of the Southern churches, um, which, you know, preached all these good things, but um, then, you know, justified slavery again. And he was saying, um, this great rhetorical um, turn of phrase that he had, um, the man who wields the, the blood clotted cow skin during the week fills the pulpit on Sunday, the slave auctioneer's bell and the church going bell chime in with each other. Um, he was an absolutely fantastic orator and um, very, you know, just very, very charismatic and also very powerful writer. And he sort of, I often return to the theme of how nothing in the human world is the way it is by any kind of necessity or nature. Um, you know, even those who um, thought that they were entitled to own other people, you know, they had become that way because their experience had led them to that. They could have been different, he felt. Um, and he wrote that a man's character, of course, it's always you know, men, um, although he was quite a feminist supporter, actually. Um, a man's character greatly takes its hue and shape from the form and, and color of things around him. Um, and that, you know, everybody involved in the, in the system of slavery is to some extent a victim of it. Um, speaking of feminism, I mean, I think the same kind of only connect argument came up in um, the writings of feminists in the set in the 18th and 19th century as well, of whom Mary Wollstonecraft, um, you know, she's very well known as a feminist, but I saw her really as, it's fascinating to see her from a humanist perspective. Um, when she wrote the vindication of the rights of women in 1792, she begins by saying, I shall first consider women in the light of human creatures um, who in common with men are placed on this earth to unfold their faculties. So it's this kind of shocking claim that women are human too <laughs> and want the same things, you know, want to unfold the faculties, live to the greatest the fulfillment of their, um, you know, moral and intellectual and personal lives that they can. And she asked, 
how you know why do women though because people said well yeah but women you know they they're vapid they've got nothing in their heads but clothes and um you know sort of for showing off and being charming and she said well even even if that's true think about why do they become that way so it's that same thing that you know education and influence is really important and you need to think critically about that um she also had a great turn of phrase she said compared them to birds um, confined in cages like the feathered race they have nothing to do but plume themselves and stalk with mock majesty from perch to perch um, instead she hoped for an education that would enable women to grow up as adults to take a really adult responsibility for their lives which you know even legally was difficult because they were not legally really considered adults at the time um, and she said, I wish to see my sex become more like moral agents. So, again, unfolding the faculties, becoming fully morally responsible for themselves. Um, and it's part of a general sense. So this is the era of the Enlightenment that she was very much influenced by and writing within. And it's part of a general sense in that period that things don't have to be the way that they always have been. Um, in Alexander Pope, there's this line, whatever is, is right, which of course was used, it was explicitly used actually to, by one writer to justify the institution of slavery. Um, it's totally circular, whatever is, is right, is just this incredibly circular, well, it's, I mean, to call it circular is a bit of an understatement. Um, and instead, it's the argument that maybe whatever is, isn't right, or it can be improved upon, um, and out of this comes that 18th century belief in, in progress, the idea of enlightenment, again, bringing light. There's a whole rhetoric of light and darkness that goes on um, by applying sort of rational thinking and, um, and a kind of human ingenuity to, to situations and by collaborating better and sharing our knowledge with each other, um, we can make things better and um, reduce suffering and... Uh, have a sort of friendship among many in Erasmus's phrase, um, rather than accepting how things are and, and especially accepting um, suffering, human suffering as being just the way that God has ordained things. So there's a very strong idea of um, against this justifying, you know, everything that happens in terms of God's punishment or God's will um, Voltaire uh, was particularly struck by an event that happened in Lisbon in 1755, an absolutely catastrophic earthquake. And there were those then from various philosophical ends of the spectrum saying that, um, well, what can we do? This is just, you know, obviously God wanted to do this. He had his reasons. Um, you know, it's no good hoping that somehow we can do anything to, I mean, there's not a lot we can do against earthquakes, but there are things that we could do to build better or to have better recovery systems. Um, you know, a lot of the disaster of that earthquake was collapsing buildings and also the fire afterwards. Um, you know, it, it just, it's just so hard disaster recovery to sort of get your social systems up and running again. Lisbon was a very, very prosperous city at that time. It's, um, you know, a, a big trading city, it was a big port. I think the shock of this event was a little bit comparable to 9-11, where you've got this sort of prosperous city that seems untouchable, that seems, you know, blessed, and then something like that happens. So there were preachers going around saying things like, you know, there was one who was a Jesuit saying, oh, well, this is obviously punishment for the fact that people in the city were listening to music or going to the theatre. Um, and, you know, another one who was a Jansenist and they were very much rivals to the Jesuits saying, no, no, it's clearly God's punishment for the fact that there's Jesuits. <laughs> um, and there were philosophers, there was, you know, the drawing on an idea that has got sort of gone down in Voltaire's paraphrase of it as um, um, 
that uh, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. So basically, if this is how things are, then it must be that this is because the way God couldn't do anything better than this. I mean, this is the optimum thing. There'll be reasons which we can't understand. Um, and Voltaire was absolutely outraged by, by this idea that we should just accept suffering. And he wrote several things about it, but the most famous was the novella, um, the philosophical uh, Kant, um, Candide, which, in which his hero goes through a whole series of, of awful sufferings, including being caught up in this earthquake. And his teacher had been saying, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds, and Condide comes to doubt this. Um, and the point of it really is not, not so much that, you know, we just sort of helplessly protest against it, although we do kind of have a right to do that, according to Voltaire, but, but that, you know, we should look for things, ways that we can just slightly ameliorate things, that we can make things um, our own systems or our technological in sort of ingenuity can be used to um, reduce suffering, to to kind of take responsibility ourselves for, for making things uh, better able to recover from disasters or that some disasters just don't happen or that we can just generally um, live better lives. And so there's this sort of sense of hope, sense of hope in the future, but it's a very active sense of hope. And I think that's very distinctive um, in this strand of humanism, the one that's kind of associated with the enlightenment and a sense of progress and a sense of hope. Um, it can seem very naive, but it's not really just sort of, oh, everything's gonna work out fine, everything's going to be good. It's more like, well, we just have to do what we can and have a kind of faith, as it were, in ourselves that we can do it. Um, I'm very <clears throat> fond of a, of a line from James Baldwin, who was a humanist, um, the 20th century writer, one is responsible to life. It is the small beacon in that terrifying darkness from which we come and to which we shall return. One must negotiate this passage as nobly as possible for the sake of those who are coming after us. Um, so again, it's that sense of active responsibility. Um, another great bit of a hero of mine is um, Bertrand Russell, who in the context of following the Second World War and in the 50s when everybody was worried about atomic weapons, nuclear war, as it became known, um, he wrote, a, he did a radio progress actually, a radio broadcast called Man's Peril about this sense that it's up to us. Um, it's quite famous parts of this, uh, the lies before us if we choose continual progress in happiness, knowledge, and wisdom, very optimistic view. Um, shall we instead choose death because we cannot forget our quarrels? I appeal as a human being to human beings, remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. I think he's getting a little carried away there. Um, but if you cannot, nothing lies before you with universe, uh, but universal death. Russell was um, really an interesting case in the kind of the 20th century and, and what it did to humanist optimism because he was born in 1872. So he was really, he grew up in this um, and into an upper class English family. Um, he grew it up in a world where there was a tremendous sense of possibility and optimism for people like him. There was a sense that things were gonna just keep getting better and better, but then came the First World War, was the first great shock. Um, he was pacifist during the First World War. And um, interestingly, I always find this amazing. So he was already too old in 1914 to be at risk of being called up himself. So he was actually already over the conscription age. Um, so he didn't have to be a conscientious objector, but he did support conscientious objectors. Um, and he then went on, he lived such a long life that um, he was still protesting against war in when the Vietnam War started. So he was still out there, you know, taking to the streets and rallies in the cause of peace, having already been too old to be signed up in the First World War. You know, there he still was um, 
out campaigning and getting arrested and, and being sent off to prison even when he was you know, in his 90s, I think. Um, so he, he saw this incredible change, the Second World War. He was actually not a pacifist in the Second World War. He thought that was a war that had to be fought because Nazism could not be, absolutely could not be uh, to, let to flourish. Um, but he looked back late in life, he looked back on his uh, experience and wrote quite a long multi-volume, three-volume autobiography. Um, and at the end of it, this is quite a long text, um, the gist of it, I won't read out the whole thing because that would be a bit tedious, you've got it up there. I may have thought that basically it would be a short road to reach this free and happy human beings um, paradise, if you like. Um, it's clearly not, but I was not wrong um, in thinking that such a world is possible. And again, that it's worthwhile to live with a view to trying to bring it that little bit nearer. And you can read the rest of it there. Um, again, it's the idea that there's something, uses the same word um, for nobility, like for what is noble as James Baldwin does, which I think is really interesting. So these things I believe, and so the world in a sense has left me unshaken despite the horrors. So I think to sum up, you know, I started by talking about the different strands of humanism, and these are just a few of the humanists that, um, that I looked at when I was writing the book, and there were an awful lot more, um, a lot of which just didn't make the cut at all, but uh, there was, there's so many of them, so many people who have pursued this, these various strands. But to, to, sum it up, to sort of sum up the different strands, I think you've got this sense of ethical responsibility and moral concern with human and non-human life here on earth. I haven't said anything about that, but you know, this is not humanism as anthropocentrism. It's not sort of exclusive of other, the rest of life, which we're all a part of. So this sense of ethical responsibility and a sort of moral concern with the value of life um, and a belief that we do have better qualities which we should cultivate. So rather than completely losing hope in ourselves um, and the sense of the being, you know, using the wisdom of the past, but also using critical thinking, not accepting anything just as because it's an ancient authority, but thinking intelligently and critically about it, but drawing on it, um, not only to understand ourselves better, but um, to sort of draw a kind of fortification and consolation to kind of build that city for ourselves. And it's not, you know, humanism is not um, a dogma or an ideology. Um, I'll leave you with the words of the scholar, unfortunately no longer with us, of, of humanism and ethics and historian as well, Zvetan Todorov, Bulgarian French uh, scholar, um, who wrote a lot about the humanist tradition. Humanism is a frail craft indeed for, to choose for setting sail around the world a frail craft that can do no more than transport us to frail happiness. But to me, the other solutions seem either conceived for a race of superheroes, which we are not, or heavily laden with illusions, with promises that will never be kept. I trust the humanist bark more. I think I'll leave it there. And if there's any questions, I'm sure there's lots of other things we can pick up on. Sarah, thank you very much for a 700-year canter through <laughs> humanism. And, and clearly, lots of things have changed over that time in humanism and even its, its expression. So it might be interesting to find out uh, whether anybody has got any questions around that. Uh, we now come to the Q&A sessions. Uh, so we'll start in the room. I'll be monitoring the online chat as well. But uh, in good old honored fashion, we'll start with you, who actually made the effort to come here in person. First of all, so who would like to ask the first question? This gentleman. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, do you think that to be a humanist, you have to reject religious dogma? Um, no, I mean, 
the thing that you know you probably sort of may be worth thinking while listening to some of that is that a lot of these humanists were not atheists or even agnostics they just didn't they worked for the church several of them they um thought within a, a religious context especially erasmus for example um so i think what really the distinction to me is that um although they were not you know questioning um the religion that that absolutely suffused the society that they lived in that the emphasis of their thought seems to have been much more on um how to live a good life how to be a good human being or how to understand oneself as a human being uh there's one in particular that i didn't mention in that that lot but i think really captures that is uh, michel de montaigne who i wrote one of my previous books was was all about him so he is quite a hero of mine um so he was the same sort of era as a little bit later than erasmus but a very similar time and he um you know massive book the essays like a thousand pages of his general thoughts and and things from his reading and things that he has reflected upon and in all of that he very rarely mentions religion but when he does it's to say things like well I you know of course I I'm a good Catholic and I totally accept the church's right to tell me what to think and you know all of that but most of the time he it's clear that he's just not really thinking about that. His attention is on what it feels like to be himself, what it feels like to be a human being, dealing with human problems, listening to what has happened to other people or reading about them in books and, you know, thinking about worrying about death. And, you know, again, he doesn't speak of that in a very religious way at all. It's like he forgets about the fact that there's supposed to be an afterlife. It's just clearly not on his mind. So it's 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 the it's more the human focus in a moral and cultural sense and all of that. That's I think what makes these people humanists. But um, because of the time that they were living in, most of them certainly you know wouldn't have recognised themselves as in in the sort of hard atheism of, of today. And even in today's context, you know, I I think that what distinguishes humanism from say like a sort of real campaigning atheism is that um, that's not really what it's about. It's not really a, an, an anti thing. It's not a negative thing. It's more about campaigning or looking to positive values to do with, you know, human life in, in all its richness and um, complexity and difficulty and everything else that we all deal with. But it's a it's a sort of positive thing rather than a negative one. So yeah. Okay, the lady at the front. Well, you've mentioned how humanism can relate to religion. I wonder how humanism relates to nationalism, in your view. Right. Yes. Well, that's a very you know a very topical question, and actually, in a way, I think, you know, I think humanism has very little, maybe I'm speaking too widely. I would certainly speak for myself and say that for me as a humanist, um, it's not consistent with nationalism. And I would distinguish that from patriotism. I mean, I'm it, that's not something that is particularly important to me, but I think it is to, to a lot of people. They feel, you know, a love of their country and all of that. That's very, very human thing to do. Nationalism implies a, a sort of, we're the best and you're you're not you know the uh, the other nations are not as good as as we are or they're not as valuable as we are and i think that's so deeply unhumanist as a perspective um i'm quite willing to you know i mean maybe people don't agree with me but i think um it's an even clearer case when you're talking about another great political phenomenon and sadly very much alive in our times which is political authoritarianism um of the kind that we're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of the rise of today. Um, an authoritarian nationalism is even sort of stronger phenomenon. Um, I think humanism by its nature tends to think in terms of the individual, not in the sense of not being connected with other people or not being part of a 
of a sort of whole network of, of humanity. I mean, one of the great humanist lines is um, from the Roman playwright Terence is, I'm human, nothing human is alien to me. Um, we're all connected in our humanity. But um, so, you know, it's, there's that sense of, there's a, there's a kind of universalism, which is a very complex thing to, to I know, to sort of analyze what that might mean. But, but I think what it does rule out is something that um, defines us in terms of a group in that triumphalist way, in that like, oh, my group is, is great and your group is not so great. So yeah, I think uh, it's looking for the bonds that connect us all. Um, is a is a very humanist tradition. Thanks. Okay, fingers are going up. I think you just beat this gentleman there. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I was interested in your answer there about uh, authoritarianism. That was my question. Really, was what are humanists to do about the gathering bloom that we we seem to be facing in the world? today in terms of authoritarianism tinged with fascism? Yeah, I mean, the, the difficult part of that question is what are we to actually do do about it? What can we do about it? I mean, it, it, the horrible thing is, you know, history repeats itself because you when you go back to the 1930s, late 20s and, and, and all through the 1930s, you can see humanists desperately asking themselves the same question. Um, what can we do? Why, how can we stop this? Why is this happening? And what can we do to stop it? So that's the, the kind of crisis that I was alluding to with Bertrand Russell is how can you hang on to a sense of hope, I suppose, is one. So there's the emotional, you know, how can I hang on to a sense of hope when everything seems to be going so um, badly a lot of the time? And the other one is in practical terms, what can you do? And I think, you know, it's just what, what everybody, not just humanists, it's sort of what we can all do, I suppose, is just um, speak ab about it, write about it, vote. Um, you know, unless you're in a position of power, it's very difficult to, I mean, you, there is this feeling of helplessness. I think we're all familiar with that um, in all sorts of contexts. And um, yeah, humanists don't have, I <laughs> Again, humanism may be a frail craft, but it's uh, it doesn't have any answers. But I think there's a lot. I think one of the things that is important is not to fall into this despair. And maybe humanism's role, more than anything else, is to um, to these things that we've seen these these people that have talked about um, needing to maintain a sense of hope and a kind of belief in ourselves because falling into complete despair just tends to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's, you know, it's kind of useful to the, the other side, if you like to call it that, if everybody that thinks of themselves as, as having sort of humane or humanist or universal values of respect for all and things like that, if everybody's kind of falling into this terrible despair, um, it's it just makes the, it even easier for them to get away with it <laughs> so oh hello uh, can i just follow up on that i read the book it was absolutely lovely great page turner cheered up my uh, winter and i liked your sense of humor and that leads me to my question and uh, what's been <laughs> said already to be a good humanist you need to be a good humorist as well <laughs> that's great i can i steal that i think i might i might, I might well quote you on that uh, yeah i think that's <laughs> well, yes, I'll have to you know, get your name. Right, yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, but again, it's, it can be a consolation, I think, having, being a humorist or seeing the funny side of things or the absurd side of things, it takes us back to that idea of, of, of a consolation again, it's it, the consolation that we find from um, laughing at things, laughing at ourselves, um, but it, it's not enough that it's just a consolation. I think we do also need to sort of, yeah, be more active as well. Mm. Be made fun of. Mm. Yeah, 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 that's right. But I'd like to think that just making fun of them is enough to 
bring them down. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether it is. I mean, certainly it's, I mean, you know, whenever you get a, a repressive society, you get jokes, don't you? I mean, this was very much the case in um, the Soviet Union during the, the, the whole sort of communist era, especially under Stalinism in, in Eastern Europe during the Soviet bloc um, years, that that jokes flourished. I mean, because it was, yeah. Did it bring it down? I don't know. I don't know if, if, how much credit the jokes actually get for the the successful ending of those regimes. I, I take exception to this comment anyway. As a, as a German, uh, that would discount a whole nation, according to the British. So we need to be careful here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, much enjoyed. I enjoyed the fact that you obviously enjoy many of the same authors that I do. And do you think perhaps that Condide had the answer that we should just tend our gardens? <laughs> yeah, well, that the famous last paragraph of uh, of Condide is we must cultivate our garden. And I remember when, like, studying that as a student, there seemed to be all this discussion. What does he mean? What can this possibly mean? Um, and I think what it means, well, my interpretation is exactly Voltaire's point, which he puts in much more serious sort of, if you like, like formal argument elsewhere, that um, it it means that we can't change everything, but in the patch that is ours, we can try to ameliorate things a little bit. We can try and make them a bit better. Um, there's this term which is not, uh, it's, doesn't, it wasn't used by Voltaire, um, but it was actually used by George Eliot, the novelist, um, meliorist. She used it in a letter. And um, when somebody asked her, did you invent that term? She said, oh, I guess I must have. I never read it anywhere else. And then and then some scholar years later found it used by some clergyman in a book published several years before her. So, you know, she didn't actually. Admit. But anyway, meliorist, it, it's meliorism is sort of the belief that um, it's important just to make things a bit better as far as we can. And maybe that's the answer to the question about what can humanists do as well. I think despair comes when you think that there has to be a really radical solution to this problem. Um, and that may be true. I mean, that for some things that might well be true. Um, but it then you can't do that. So then you feel despair, whereas ameliorist approach is just well okay I can't do that but I can cultivate my garden or I can go and plant a tree you know it's it's something you know yeah any more questions in the room oh this gentleman can I skip us thank you um you you touched on this at the end you were talking about humanism not being um anthropocentric Mm. Given that we, you know, are slowly coming to understand that we're basically just cap very capable animals, is there going to be a time when we're going to need a rebrand? Um, a rebrand of humanism. A rebrand of humanism to include. Um, uh, apparently, we're we're starting to understand that certain whales have an alphabet. I mean, if we could start to communicate with them, discuss these issues with them. Well, yeah. I mean, just to sort of. Um to check that I got got your your point sort of do we need a new term for humanism to capture the fact that we now very much realize that well we're animals and lots of other animals have abilities that are very related to ours and very... I think um what has happened in the humanist movement in recent you know every so often they produce manifestos and then they refine it and there'll be a new manifesto to sort of try and define a bit better what they stand for it's really interesting looking back on the manifestos. Um, the first one was in the 30s and, you know, how they've been refined since then. Um, or oh, that wasn't actually the humanist society that there is today. But anyway, there have been humanist manifestos since 1933 of all the years to do it. Um, that you can see how it's gradually moved from being entirely about human beings as if, you know, other animals in the natural world just didn't have any role in this at all, to more and more putting towards the center this 
acknowledgement or this understanding that we're completely woven into the natural world. We're totally dependent on it. We are it, we are part of it, and that it's part of being a, a humanist, according to the movement today, to um, be have a responsible attitude towards that and to uh, you know, make it a central part of humanism. I mean, it is in a way, I, I think the term humanism does lend itself to exactly that um, misunderstanding, confusing it with anthropocentrism or putting humans, you know, vaunting humans as being above everything else. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard. To, the, the only question rebranding is what would you call it instead? <laughs> I mean, it's really, you know, it does come back to this important sense that it's, um, it's not abstractions, it's not authorities, it's not divine commandments, it's it's not, you know, a religious text. Is those are not the things from which we should take our sense of meaning and and morality. We take it from our we're humans, from our human experience, our human lives, and our. Um, human sense of connection to everything else, including to the rest of the natural world. So I think there is still a role for having the word human in there. Okay. But thanks, that's a very interesting point. There's a lady at the back just before that. To what extent, just building on what you've just said in the previous question, to what extent does humanism uh, relate to an attitude in the world and the Aristotelian concept of phrenesis? doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Yeah, I mean, but I think all of moral philosophy, you could say, is, it, that is, I mean, I think the answer is yes, but I wouldn't like to think that it was limited to an Aristotelian ethics. I think that humanist ethics um, is sort of... In, it, it encompasses all the various ethical approaches of which some are, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a whole, I don't want to get kind of bogged down in the various bases for ethical thought, but um, I think they all have humanist strands. And that's what's, in, it, that's what's important. It's kind of where the emphasis is when you're talking about it. I don't know if that addresses your question. It sounds a bit um, garbled, but <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah, 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 thanks. I was going to ask you if you had looked at taking the origins back even further and looked at the parallels between humanism and go back 2000 years into towards the Indian subcontinent, look at um, the philosophy of Buddhism, which would also relate to animals other than humans and pulling all that together as mm. all of the beings being of the same importance and encompassing i would say the west the later western philosophy of humanism sure yes thanks very much and the other great um candidate really that uh, sort of cried out to be written about was confucian philosophy which is also has enormous amount in common with a lot of the western humanist tradition in everything from the sort of the emphasis on the, the notion of humanity and the notion of how we're all connected through our basic humanity the importance of education, the fact that it's incredibly important. I didn't really talk about that much, but a lot of humanists have always been um, extremely concerned with how do we educate people well, because we do become, you know, we're, we're not sort of born fully formed. We, we are formed by our education. It makes a big difference to what kind of people we're going to be and what our relationship with others is going to be. And that's very much part of Confucian thought. Um, so that's and that's right. And there's also a fascinating um, materialist tradition in India, the Chardavaka school, which um, is very ancient and has a lot of similarities with um, some of the Epicurean thought in ancient Greece. So, I mean, there's masses more that could be written about. And actually, in the book, I touch on some of those to sort of set the framework. But um, I had to keep some kind of um, connection between the people I write about and some sort of structure to it and I just thought I've got to limit it somehow so if, sort of limiting it to 700 years and basically European thought uh, not exclusively but largely um, just 
it that's the book that I ended up writing and with all it's sort of acknowledging all those limitations um but there's so much more to be written about all of that and uh somebody with probably more expertise in those philosophies than me would should write it we've got a question online has. we've got a question online from eleanor mm -hmm. in a world dominated by social media which often makes them feel pressurized to be a certain way and not think critically and often depressed how can young people be introduced to humanism? Well, through social media is not a bad answer to that because actually, you know, as I say, these humanist organizations do engage a lot with social media. They do try and, um, you know, use those things to um, communicate and to reach out. Um, and to put a human humanist perspective, especially if a debate is seems to be sort of, you know, descending <laughs> as they often do. Um, I mean, I don't think the answer is to withdraw from those things. Um, although I must admit, I don't use social media very much myself. But um, it's, you know, I, I, yeah, you've got to stay engaged. So, yeah, between formal education and just generally outreach and and making humanist voices heard i think it's 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 useful that there is this yeah. means good. of communication thank you another question here in the room um good evening um you've touched on it briefly already i d i just want to ask in a bit more detail um so you've um you've drawn a clear distinction between humanism and say atheism and I wanted to ask you, um, as you've gone through your study of humanist thinking, when do you start to see humanist thinking without the crutch of religion? Because you've mentioned how a lot of humanists, because of the epoch they lived in, you know, had to think with religion. I couldn't really think outside of that. When, when do you start to see that shift? Would you say it's enlightenment or, you know, is it is it linked to te technological progress? Or, or are there older examples of humanists who sort of eschew religious thinking entirely and sort of think of... yeah. You know, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, um, great question. And one of the things, of course, is that um, it's very difficult to know what people really thought going back into a time when you just didn't put something along those lines in print. I mean, you didn't put in print, you know, there is no God or something like that. I mean, it's absolutely out of the question. It would be very, very dangerous. And, and, and even sort of speaking openly about it. I mean, there are studies which are very interesting that have been done looking at records of the Inquisition in various Italian states, like in Venice. I think that they've been studied, you know, what people being interrogated by the Inquisition, what they said, and, and quite a lot of them were saying, you know, things like it's all a plot by the church to to get our money out of us basically, or to sort of, you know, take control of us. And, you know, I don't believe in any of that. And and that sort of flies in the face of the used to be, the, you know, there have been theories that it was literally impossible to be an atheist before a certain date. And there's been some work done on finding evidence that it's not that straightforward. So, you know, um, but having, I mean, so in a way there's two answers. One is that, yeah, I'm sure it's always, I, I, I think it's always been around um, there, you know, there's, it's hard to find evidence of it because people would either not say anything or, or speak in riddles. Um, but um, you do, on the other hand, of course, have a definite historical um, sequence of events that starts, I think in the 17th century was really the, the turning point um, where you, you start to get people that are, um, sort of saying that that little bit more and um, particularly talking about, I mean, Spinoza is a figure who is, I think, fascinating, absolutely fascinating philosopher who um, argued that, among other things, he argued that maybe there could be a society um, com completely composed of atheists which in which actually everybody was fine and everything functioned all right and there was a morality. It's like we could have morality without without God was the implication. And that was, to call somebody an atheist was like calling them a person without morals. You know, it's like if, you, if you're if you an atheist, you obviously can't have any moral principles. So, and it, the argument was beginning to appear, well, actually there might be other bases for morality. There might be other reasons to 
to behave well. And um, and I think that's when there's there's very definitely you're starting to see a shift. But even then, I mean, well after the Enlightenment was sort of in its high period, you couldn't publish what you really thought. A con deed was was published under a pseudonym, and then Voltaire had great fun going around asking people, oh, I've heard there's this really interesting novel called Condide. Any idea who's written it, who wrote it? You know, it's, uh, um, and Diderot was, he was really, Voltaire was, probably wasn't really an atheist. I mean, he, he was a deist, which is rather different, but Diderot probably was an atheist. And, and he wrote things which he knew he couldn't publish. He just put them in the, yeah, put them away in a drawer and circulated them amongst his friends. But, you couldn't publish openly, even then. Uh, good evening. Uh, oh, if you were asked to describe um, humanism as a way of living, what would main principles of such a way of life be? And would be they anyhow different from Ten Commandments, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think humanism by its nature tends not to want commandments, but that did, it's quite funny really, that the great debate came out about that when the first humanist manifesto was put together, as I say, 1933, and it was sent out to various prominent um, philosophers, quite a lot of uh, religious figures as well actually were involved in it. Um, but some of them, some of the best known, you know, you would have thought would be right there signing this manifesto and putting their names to it came back saying, because I think there were 15 points to this first manifesto in draft form, and somebody came back saying, well, that's 50% more than the Ten Commandments. <laughs> we don't need more commandments. I mean, there's a, you know, that's completely against the whole principle of, of humanism. But I think it, it it is, as I say, there are all these manifestos that have come out of the humanist movement, and it is useful, I think, to do that, because you've got to People have got to have some idea what you stand for. Otherwise, it's, uh, I mean, it's difficult enough as to define humanism. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of encourage, rather than me trying to remember what all the latest ones are, I think, it, you know, you can go online. They're all online, the humanist manifestos. And it's, it's, it is really interesting seeing how it's evolved, reading all the past ones and seeing how it's changed. Over the decades. So is it more a question of being rather than definition? I think, well, that's the point. I think it is also, there's a need for a definition, or at least there's a need for some statement of, of the principles. Otherwise, you just come down to, I mean, E.M. Forster, um, bless, you know, sort of bless his cotton socks, because I'm a great admirer of his, but he, when he was asked for a definition of humanism, he said, well, rather than trying to define it, I would just list all the people I've ever loved and all the books I've ever enjoyed and all the, you know, all the things that have ever sort of made me happy. Those are not his exact words, but it was along those lines, you know, there's no definition. I just think about all the people I care about and all the books I've loved. And I mean, that is great, but of course it is a bit... Um, doesn't necessarily answer the question of what is humanism <laughs> very well. Yeah. Uh, do you think humanism would help us decide who to vote for in the coming election? <laughs> well, that would be telling, wouldn't it, if I if I said yes, <laughs> given what the choices are. Um, but that is a matter of opinion. I wouldn't like to. Be interesting to find out that how many of them are humanists. Yeah, um, I mean, it's the, there is something to be said about the role of of religion in politics in this country, which is, and it's, I mean, it's not quite like in America where I think it's it's sort of almost impossible to have any hope of being president if you don't lay claim to some religious faith. Even Trump has, you know, pretends to pretends to be religious uh, it's i'm probably going to get sued by by somebody for implying that he's just pretending um in this country too though you know it's it's pretty unusual to have uh avowed atheists and i mean this uh, this is getting back into history again but there was a, a fascinating case in the 19th century of charles bradlaugh who was 
the um he was elected as mp but in in those days you had to take the religious oath of office it, you couldn't just make an affirmation as you took it you couldn't take up your seat in parliament unless you swore on the bible your oath of office and he refused to do that because he he was the president of the national secular society and he was not he was a non-believer and they threw him out um, wouldn't let him take up his seat and become MP. I mean, literally physically threw him out of the building at, at one point. And he kept going back. So then there'd be a by-election because there was no MP. So he'd stand again and his constituents would vote for him again. And so he'd be back there in Parliament trying to take up his seat um, and, you know, be thrown out again. And this it was only on like the third time that he'd been uh, voted that they um, relented and allowed him to take up his Well, clearly what they needed was your book, the book of humanism, <laughs> yeah. to <laughs> pass allegiance to. Any final questions before we do it? You have to repeat that for the online audience with the microphone. Perhaps it helps to choose a politician by being a humorist, humanist, but to put up with them when you've chosen them, you need to be a humorist. Yeah, yes, that's it. But I mean, I'm not sure we want our politicians to be humorists. I think we've had we've we've had some rather humorist politicians. I, well, I don't know. Nigel Farage is on the leadership debate today, so <laughs> that might change things a bit. Right. Um final thoughts. No. In which case I'll draw things to a conclusion, but please put your hands together for an excellent talk by Sarah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Before before you go, uh, Sarah's book is still available at the back and, uh, for for you to purchase if you want to. I'm I just to, happy to sign copies and signed copies available as well. Before before you do that, I just want to talk to you about the forthcoming program next month. We have a talk, and I'm paraphrasing this a little bit now. How we find meaning in the world. So that's one uh, in in July. We then have a well-earned break during August. In September, we've got Professor Simon Blackburn uh, coming back to us to talk about what is truth, which would be interesting. And then in October, we've got the global origins of psychology. So I hope to see you then, and hope to see you in, in July, and then have a fantastic summer holiday. See you then. <laughs>